Major support for these broadcasts is provided by the CUNY TV Foundation, New York Community Bank, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chelsea Lighting, Capital One Bank, Genova Burns, Giantomasi and Webster, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, The Wickoff Group, Greenberg Traurig, m and Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance, Additional support is provided by Ackman Ziff Real Estate Group, Bank of America Merrill Lynch, Briarwood Organization, C.B. Richard Ellis, Colliers International New York, Cushman and Wakefield, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development Levine Builders, DDG, Friedman LLP Accountants and Advisors, Flushing Bank, Herrick Feinstein LLP Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, James Orfanides Centurion Holdings, John Katsimatidis Red Apple Group, Corman Communities, a.k.a. Hotels, Madison Realty Capital, Margolin Weiner and Evans, LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Massey Knackle Realty Services, New Banks, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Grub Knight Frank, Popular Community Bank, Sterling & Sterling, SJP Properties, Stonehenge Partners, Urban American, and These Friends. His name is Eric Repair. He's a chef. He's the co-owner of La Bernadette. He's a TV star. He's an author. He's everything. And this is only in 48 short years. I'm so happy and lucky to have my friend Eric Repair today on Building New York, New York Life Stories. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. Okay. Hello. So let's talk, you know, you know, there are all these books, there's these articles, you, you watch, you know, these shows uh, on the table of Eric, you have all these situations. People really want to know who the true Eric Repair is. So let's talk about it. Tell me about your parents, because you told me that your father was a banker. Yes. And your mother uh, a designer. So tell me well, about Well, she was in the fashion industry, right. and, and she had stores. And then so let's talk about your father first. So my father uh, was born in Provence, and his father was uh, military. He was coming from a um, humble family of Provence, farmers and so on. And then he went to school and study, and uh, um, he ended his career being uh, president a of a bank. Yes. He was a regional president of BNP. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, he passed on at a very young age, 42 years old. He was of age. 42 years old. He had a heart attack. At the time, um, he was diagnosed with uh, cholesterol. And it was no cure for that. It was probably, you know, too much good French food. At the time. Maybe, could be, I don't know. Yeah. And then your, your mother, um, yes. also her background. My mother was, uh, she was born in Morocco, came when Morocco became independent uh, to France, lived in, uh, near Nice, and uh, then she uh, worked in the fashion industry for a long time and lived in Saint-Tropez, met my father, they got married, and they got divorced. Now, you were saying to me, it was very interesting because you, growing up uh, as a youth, you were privileged and you, you know, in, with, with your mother, you know, they, they were, you know, there was a bottle of uh, Bordeaux, you know, there was uh, fine china. It was a very interesting, like learning fine food, living fine food. And then when you'd leave your mother's and you'd go to your grandparents, it was more of a soul food. Yes. Right? Absolutely. My grandparents, my aunts also uh, were, were delighted to have me playing with my cousins and so on. And they would cook for me all the time because they knew I love food. And it was soul food uh, from Provence and from Italy because I had a grandmother from Italy. However, at home, my mother was very um, inspired by the movement of Nouvelle Cuisine. And um, she was very refined uh, and she's, she's still alive and she's still very very refined in her way of, of, of living. And therefore, we would have different china from breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Uh, always a good bottle of Bordeaux on the table, uh, appetizer, main course, dessert, lunch, and dinner. 
um, that so she will wake up very early. Wait a second, you, you kept slim. I mean, with all that type of food, you could have been like the sum of the sizes of our mutual friends in the industry. Well, you know, when you grow up and you're young, you can eat a lot. <laughs> That's the beauty of it. You, you just go like that. <laughs> now, you were saying, I think, one of the books that you, you learned to bake uh, breadsticks as a... Uh, I didn't really learn how to, how to bake. However, when I was with my mother, actually, I was five, and I remember it was in Saint-Tropez. Um, she would cook for the, for the family, and she would make bread, and she would let me roll some bread sticks with her, and I, I, and I was so happy. And I, of course, they were unedible, but it didn't right, matter. But, but you know what? The interesting situation is you, you know, growing up, you, you learn fine food, you learn fine dining, but you really weren't involved with cooking. You didn't know you were going to be a, a chef at that time, correct? No, I had a, a, a lot of passion and admiration for chefs, and I loved um, fancy restaurants for, the, for l'art de la table, like we say in French. Uh, and I love good food, but I had no idea that um, I would become a chef. However, I was always looking at cookbooks instead of studying. Now, what was interesting, you told me that one of the things that may have changed your life was uh, you, your parents, your mother sent you to boarding school? She sent me to boarding school at a very young age. At age, uh, at, I was eight years old for one year, and then I came back home. Right, but at boarding school, they advanced you, so which yes. had an effect on your educational purposes because yes. you went from the third to like to the fourth grade, and yes. then when you came back to regular school, you were behind the curve, as you would say. Absolutely, and I, I because of that reason, I missed all the good, strong basics in mathematics and many other um, things that I was supposed to, to learn. And, and I ended up uh, being behind, and you, I never catch up. So I was, I was a bad student, right? And, and, a and student, at, right? And at 15, you know, it's interesting. You were telling me growing up at 15, you had, you know, you go to a different. You could have gone to a, you know, a, a program which would be the literary literature and arts or the vocational school. Yes. So basically. You went to the vocational school. Of, of course. So tell me. Uh, I had such a, well, I had such a passion uh, for cooking and, and, and I mean, for cooking, looking at it and eating that I thought culinary school would be a great idea for me to, to go and become a chef and, and, and therefore eat well <laughs> first. Uh, and then my second choice was to become a, f a forest uh, ranger. A forest ranger. But then you, as you said to me, you might have not passed the test. I was so bad in school, I, they were concerned that I wouldn't pass the test. Uh, so the principal of the school knew the principal of the culinary school in Perpignan, called him and said, look, I have a young man here who's passionate and so on. Can you try to so take in you, So in your two years at the culinary school, was it a culinary school or you really learned waiting or was it, was it was some cooking? The program, uh, the first year you do cooking and you are a waiter at times and you learn a, a lot of different disciplines. The second year you, you focus more on cooking and obviously you still learn French and, and other disciplines as well. And, and uh, I was learning Spanish and English and so on. Um, but uh, I was really, really uh, cooking uh, much more than the first year, yes. So you graduate at 17, and then, yes, and, and, and then you know, you said, oh, I went to two years of culinary school, I'm going to get a job. You send out, what, 18 letters or 19 letters? 18 letters to the eight, actually 19. 18 uh, three-star Michelin in France, received my letter, applying for a job, and, and Maxim's. I don't know why, I, I had a fascination for Maxim's. Uh, only Maxim's answer to my letters saying, we have nothing for you. <laughs> and two months later, La Tour d'Argent, which was a 400 years old restaurant, an institution, a landmark in Paris, um, uh, sent me a letter saying, call us, we have this something for you. It was a Friday. On Monday, I was with my luggage in Paris. So tell me about this 400-year-old restaurant. What did you do there? I started as a commis. So commis was basically the help of the Chef, chef saucier uh, or chef poissonnier. Or, uh, so you will help someone responsible for a station. And uh, I started there at 17 and uh, realized very quickly that I was very weak. Um, I had to, a lot to learn. But I learned the basics uh, in that restaurant, uh, which, w which is essential. Uh, classic cooking um, is essential if you want to evolve 
later on because it's again the, the very strong um, base uh, that you will always need in, in your life. It, you have a better understanding of how source could evolve, um, how to, you have a, a big array of techniques that allow you to, to be um, more, more diversified when you cook. You're there for two years, correct? Mm -hmm. And then? Yes, two years. And then what do you do? After that, the chef sent me to Jamin with a, a well-known chef called Joël Robuchon, who was considered at the time um, the, best, the best chef right, in the you world. And you showed me he was so advanced at that time. He, he had pictures, he had, the, the, the way he, he presented. He was like, he, he was, a, he was be before his times, as we would say, right? Oh, definitely, yes. Um, it, it was a huge difference in between what he was doing. He was here and everybody else was here. And uh, 25 cooks in a kitchen, 45 covers. Working, we were working 16 hours a day. We barely uh, could be ready for lunch and dinner. We had so much to do, but the food was so precise and what, um, so incredible what we were doing in that kitchen. Um, so that was invaluable, that experience with Mr. Robuchon. Then it's time for you to go to the military? Yes, because at the time you had to give one, one year of your life uh, to now, now, what was interesting, you know, since you were a chef at this time, you, you said to me that the food was so unedible in the military, you didn't even want to be a chef in the military, right? Yes. I was affected to what they call the um, um, mess of, for the officers. Um, I don't know if you say that in English. Yes, no, please. When I was in the Army, uh, I was in the Army Reserve, they wouldn't allow me because I didn't, I, I think I made coffee incorrectly. It was, oh, wow. that, that's how qualified I was. They burn spaghettis cooking them in water. How can you burn spaghettis in water? They, they managed to do that the first day I was in the kitchen, so then I went to see the coronel and I said to him, look, I don't mind to be a military, but I can't do that. Bad food. So, so you spent one year as a waiter? <laughs> I, w I became his waiter. You became the colonel's waiter. Yeah, I was the, the, the yes. So now you finish your one year in military obligation and then you, you go back, to, and where do you go back to work now? Well, Joël Robuchon called me and said, I have a, a position for you, um, Chef Poissonnier, in charge of the fish station. Would you like to come back? And I remember I was on the phone with him. Uh, I was at the military base and I said, um, I need to think about it. And he said, sure, you can think about it. You have 30, 30 seconds. Uh, so I, I was like, oh, wow. So I said yes, and I went back. I never regret it, of course. And then? Then, uh, two years later, a little bit more than two years later, I wanted to get out of France. I wanted to travel the world. Why? I mean, come on. You were having good uh, travel the world. So you travel the world, and you end up at, at the, the infamous Watergate Hotel. Uh, yeah. Well, for, not for the food. No, not for the food. <laughs> I didn't say for the food. Okay, uh, the, the Watergate Hotel, that, that happened to have one of the best restaurants in the world at that time, correct? Yes. Uh, Jean-Louis Paladin was the chef of the Watergate Hotel. It was a tiny dining room. Um, what he was doing was amazing. He was, in America, a pioneer uh, for working with fishermen, uh, growers. They were growing different vegetables for him and herbs and so on. He was, he was bringing the seeds in his suitcase hidden somewhere from Europe and so on. Um, I, I learned a lot from Jean-Louis Paladin. Now, you said to me that it was interesting because it was Washington. You felt that you were cooking for, t for lawyers all the time, right? I, I, most of the clientele, they, they were lawyers uh, or attorneys, yes. Uh, because in, in Washington, I read uh, at the time that it was 15,000 lawyers, and I was like scratching my head. I was like, how can it be 15,000 people <laughs> working in, in, in a law office? Offices. Uh, but we had a loyal clientele, and uh, it was also a destination. And, and Jean-Louis was um, uh, extremely um, lo beloved in Washington and, and well-known. And uh, with um, Alice Waters, they were both pioneers in, in um, bringing good food and, and cooking well, of course. So how do you leave Washington to come to the Big Apple? So Jean-Louis, uh, I, I want to leave Jean-Louis and I want to come to New York because I'm bored in Washington. I'm 23 years old. Not a, not a great social it's life. A, it's a as, you, as, as you said, you were very, in, in, the, in the building, you were the, uh, you were the minority, correct? I was the minority in the building for sure. Um, and uh, it was a boring city for me. I mean, 
to see 23, you want to have and fun. I, and I have. I had seen New York before, spent a couple of weekends, and I was like, this is a, it's a cool town, it's a party town, and it's young, and it's happening. So I went to work for David Boulet, that I knew from Robuchon, because he was in training um, previously. You uh, met him in, pa in, in Paris. Paris, yes. He came a few weeks in training, and I met him, and we became friends. So I go work for David. I didn't get along with David at that time, um, and, and David was very successful. He just got four star in the New York Times, and so on. So uh, Le Bernardin offered me. Uh, so that, you know, Le Bernardin originally started in, in in Paris. In Paris, then they came here. Yes, uh, they had a place, and then they finally moved in 1986 to their to the present location yes, where you are. York. And uh, Maggie and her brother Gilbert uh, yes. had the, the restaurant, and. You told me that it's 7.40 in the morning, right? You, you had... June 10th. June 10th. Uh, what year was it? it June 10, 1991, at 7.40 a.m., I entered the, the walls of Le Bernardin, the kitchen now, of Le Bernardin. Now, it was interesting that Gilbert uh, had spent time with you beforehand. He wanted to get to know you, right? Yes. You go, uh, when I left David Boulet, I, uh, before I started at Le Bernardin, I decided to take a vacation, go see my family, and then go to Spain and enjoy um, Spain. And, and Gilbert asked me if he could come with me and uh, visit Spain at, uh, at the same time. So it, it surprised me a little bit, but we ended up during my vacation with my future boss partying in San Sebastian and Barcelona and Madrid. And then I came back to New York and started at Le Bernardin. Now, at this time, Le Bernard then had a four-star from the New York Times, correct? Yes. It had a four-star. Yes. It, it was... Brian Miller. Brian Miller, who, as Drew Naporin said to me, was not the easiest critic to get a, any star from, had given, you a, had given the restaurant a four-star. So what are you doing at Le Bernard then at this time? Well, I am the chef de cuisine. Gilbert Lecoz at the time wanted to develop some uh, rest some other restaurants. Uh, they had restaurants in Atlanta, Florida. He wants to, so at that time, when I come, uh, they opened Miami, Gilbert and Maggie, and I'm consulting the restaurant in Miami, but I'm based in New York. I'm, I'm the chef of the kitchen of Le Bernardin, and then open Atlanta, and I do the same. I consult a little bit Atlanta and Miami, but I'm really in charge of uh, uh, New York. And Gilbert wants to open more restaurants at that time. Unfortunately for him, in 1994, um, and that was a tragedy, um, he passed away j one day before he goes on vacation. So what happened? Uh, Joubert was uh, exercising in the, b in the building with La Bernadette. Yes. And uh, he, he, he... He was with his trainer. He, he had uh, a trainer three times a week or something like that. And he said to his trainer, um, he didn't finish the, the hour that he was supposed to, to do with the trainer and said, uh, I'm tired, I'm, I'm, I'm done went down and uh, went to the locker room, lay down to relax, and never woke up. Now, at that day, you were at the James Beard. Yes, for the first time, Le Bernardin was cooking at the James Beard. I was uh, about to start dinner when I f find out. And uh, I thought a couple of minutes, a couple of seconds probably, uh, should I do the dinner, should I cancel the dinner? And then I decided to, to cook at the Beard that night in his honor. And, and, and the restaurant was also open that And time. the restaurant was open at the same time, yes. And, and nobody knew until I came back to the restaurant to announce that uh, Gilbert Lecoz passed away. Now, so you at this time are 29 years of age? Uh, yes, I'm 29. And, and th you know, and then there was questions, you know, people like uh, Ruth uh, Richard. Ruth, Ruth Rachel was the food critic of food the New critic. York Times. And, time, and yes. basically, you know, the question is, is Eric Repair as good as he, he looks, you know, or was it, you know, Gilbert or, uh, Gilbert and everything? But what happens is over the next, it took nine months, and then you came back with a four-star New York Times. Yes. Um, she, she started to come in September, and, and in April, the, the review came out, and it was a four-star review. And she visited the restaurant 12 times. So she really took her time and uh, came many times to check to see, to see if I was up to the standards. Now, we were talking about the face of La Berna then. One day, tell the story with Maggie and... Uh, well, um, Maggie because was... Because you, 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 you are La Berna then with Maggie, but you, you're the face, you're the chef. I mean, you have the chefs over there. You have 45 people in the kitchen yes. over there. But you, you're also the, 
the face you are La Bernadette? Well, Maggie also, but Maggie was very much in the media uh, promoting the restaurant and also very much uh, in touch with the clientele and so on and, and, and really uh, created Le Bernardin. So she was naturally representing a, a restaurant. Um, and, but she was pushing me and I was reluctant, first of all, to go in a dining room and interact with clients. I was very intimidated and, and very nervous. I didn't right, you like said it. to me you used to sweat when I you... I used to sweat so much that when I would go back to the kitchen, my back would be completely uh, uh, wet. The jacket would be wet um, from the stress. Uh, obviously, I, uh, today it, it, it's, a natu right. it's natural for me to go so, to the So you room. then took over more of the outside, and, uh, and then that's when you came out with the first book, the, the La Bernadette this was, cookbook. Yes. Uh, this was an homage to Gilbert Lecoz and to the team of Le Bernardin, yes. Right, so, that was, so that's when you and uh, uh, Maggie came out with that cookbook, which, yes. was, which was really a cookbook and a story of how La Bernardin started. Yes, over there. from Paris and coming to New York. Right, a and then, then the second book, you know, there aren't too many chefs uh, who have four books over here. Th then the second book uh, this one. was The Return, Return to, to cooking, cooking, which is more of your talk about the cookbook and, and the work that you've done. Yes, it's more about uh, creativity um, and, and experimenting with that book. Um, and what about this book? This one is the latest one. It's, it's a companion uh, book of the series on PBS, Avec Eric. Uh, what about On the Line? And that one, On the Line, is really a, um, a snapshot, uh, a document documentary of Le the life of Le Bernardin and the life of the team of Le Bernardin and the way we function at Le Bernardin. You are heavily in the media, okay? How do you do the, uh, the Avec Eric, who is an Emmy award-winning PBS series? Tell him. Yes. We, we won an, uh, an Emmy with uh, Avec Eric, which was <laughs> pretty good. No question. So how did you become a, a TV uh, celebrity? I like, I, I enjoy uh, the media in general, and, and I enjoy television. Um, I like to, it for me... You didn't realize this is radio today. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, I, I, I like to share my knowledge. I like to share my passion. I'm also very curious. And I also, I, I, I learn a lot when I, I, I do a TV show, or if I am, for instance, with you. I, I, just the fact that I try to articulate um, and, and explain to you what I have done, uh, I have a better understanding of the process, and it helps me to be better. So this series over here, was, it, was, it was a difficult series for you to, to, to film because you're running a restaurant, yes. and you're, you're, so you're at the kitchen, and then you're also traveling around the world, right? Yes, we travel around the world, and, and it was, the, the episodes are broken down in three pieces. Uh, shooting at the restaurant, showing uh, the kitchen, or, or the life of the restaurant, traveling for inspiration, and, and going uh, in Italy, uh, hunting wild boar, and, and uh, interacting with beekeepers in California, and so on, and then going back to a studio kitchen, to cook from the inspiration of my trip. So it takes a long time to do one episode. You know, you talk about inspiration, and I think one of the interesting things about your life and inspiration, which helped you grow and be cult uh, cultivate you, was the inspiration of the Dalai Lama. Because as you were saying to me, yes. you couldn't have been as successful today because you were tough to deal with. And the Dalai Lama helped you out. Tell For me. sure. I, I was um, trained in France um, in the kitchen, and it's very tough. Um, you, t you train people uh, by humiliating them, by breaking them, and then you rebuild, supposedly, the individual. Uh, so, when I so it's a very abusive system. When I came to Le Bernard, it's, it's, you know, it's very interesting. It's the way medical residents were trained. On the 16-hour oh. concept, we burn them down, and then at least they can grow. We let them. Um, I was, I was li like that, but I was a very abusive chef uh, with a lot of energy. And uh, I realized one day that I was not happy uh, in my life. W and also, I had a big turnover. I was losing the good, good people in my team. Um, the system didn't work. I was, so I, 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 at the same time, um, I read the acceptance uh, speech uh, of the Dalai Lama when they gave him the Nobel Prize uh, for peace. And I was so inspired that um, I started to read books and then I went to his teachings and, and, and I was attracted to um, uh, Buddhism. 
and it totally changed uh, my view on on not only the way I will manage a kitchen, but it changed my life. And, and since I have been uh, studying um, Buddhism and, and mostly the teaching for me, Solinus. Now on the table, tell me about that show. So on the table, uh, you can uh, go on the table via YouTube. Mm. Uh, what I do is that I, I cook with my guest and I basically uh, interview my guest uh, and we cook and we drink together. It's a very relaxed atmosphere. We, um, we spend uh, two, three hours cooking. And I try, I try to do exactly what you are doing with me now. <laughs> uh, I try to find out uh, who, who my guests are and, and what is their passions and what they now, do in life and so on. Now, what about these Top Chef and these other um, chef shows that you've been on? I have been uh, judging on Top Chefs uh, uh, many times. Uh, I had fun, and, and it obviously brings good visibility, and it's uh, it's very it's complementary of, of the image of the chef that I am. Now you, you've 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 increased La Bernardin also. You've had outposts uh, in Washington and Philadelphia, but yes. you also have continuing to re have one at the Cayman Islands and the Ritz yes. uh, Ritz Carlton. But it's called Blue. It's called Blue. We have only one Le Bernardin, and we have a restaurant now in Cayman called Blue, which is, I call it Le Bernardin by the beach. Uh, much more, much more um, Caribbean uh, style of cooking, more relaxed. Uh, it's a resort, um, and uh, the, the, the food is, is Le Bernardin style, but with Caribbean influence. Now, something that you said to me that you've been very involved with is City Harvest. Tell me about that. Yes, so City Harvest uh, in New York, I think, does a fantastic job in feeding hungry people, um, educating also uh, people how to eat better. Um, City Harvest uh, feeds 600,000 people uh, per month, uh, brings in the Bronx and in Staten Island some uh, mobile markets and bring fresh ingred ingredients. Some chefs teach people what to do with them because they have never seen fresh ingredients. Um, in New York City, 20% of the population, and this is a num the number comes from the city hall, uh, lives under poverty level. One out of five children doesn't know when he's going to have his next meal. So City Harvest is something that I really, really care for. I'm, I'm very engaged in it. I'm the co-chair of, of the board now of, of City Harvest. And uh, I, I really feel that it's a must and, and two and two people. other things are very important in your life with like 20 seconds is you are married for how many years and you have a son i know i live with my wife for 21 years married for eight and my son is nine right and you're the name of your wife and your son sandra and my son is Adrian. and, and it, it's interesting that how you met your wife she was going for her ma uh, phd she had her masters and she was working in baranda yes. as a hostess and that's how you met her yeah, exactly. Actually, I'm married for, from f uh, for 14 years. Not married eight. 14 years. Okay. So I would like to say, in, in your short lifespan, you have you have you have grown and you'll continue to grow. And I'm so happy that I've had you on my show today. No, Thanks thank you very much. Here. It's a great pleasure and I'm very honored. Thank, thank you. Thank you.